As they are dismissing, if you would stand with me and turn your Bibles to the gospel according to John again today. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. Matthew, will you shut that door for me over there, please? John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. The scripture reads there in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. It says, again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And he said unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelleth. And he abode with him, and they abode with him for, a de for that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he saith, said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is being interpreted, or interpretation, a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find his Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing Come out of Nazareth. And Philip said unto him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said unto him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is or is no guile. And Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered and said, and, and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Let's pray. Fathers, we bow before you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the time of worship that we've had already. We're thankful, Lord Jesus, for all the young people that are throughout the facility tonight. And we just pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bless them, that you would use your word to uh, penetrate their hearts and their lives and begin to mold their minds in a way that they would think after you. I pray not only for them, but for us that are here and for those that may be tuned in by Facebook or listening by a radio program. I just pray, Lord Jesus, that you would speak to us where we're at, that you would bring conviction upon the hearts of the lost, that you would draw them unto yourself, that they would have an opportunity to repent of their sin and trust in you and be saved. Lord, for us who are saved, I pray that you would continue to shape us into the people that you want us to be. Lord, you've called us to be a peculiar people, a holy people, a different people in a fallen world such as that we're in. We're called to be the lights of the world. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd forgive us and cleanse us of our sin, us who, have, who are already saved and where we may have failed you in doing that. And I pray that you would just help us tonight to hear from you and respond to you and, and that we would be a people who are set on fire for you. And we are reminded not only of our initial conversion experience, but to see your faithfulness throughout our lives as, as your children. And I pray, Lord, that we would uh, be awakened and that we would be revived and that we would be a people that are catching on fire for you. I ask for your help to preach tonight. I ask for a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit. I ask you how many behind the cross. And I pray as you are high and lifted up, you would draw men unto yourself as we give you all the praise. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
may be seated. This morning, I talked to you a little bit about what is your testimony. And we talked about how that John the Baptist was a servant of the Lord. He was called of the Lord to go and prepare the way of Messiah. And though John the Baptist may not have known exactly who the Messiah was during that time of his ministry until the Spirit of God descended upon Jesus and revealed unto him such, we know that he was still faithful in serving God. And when he was confronted by the religious leaders of his day asking, who are you? He said, are you the Christ? And he said, no. And he said, are you, uh, you know, Elijah? And he said, no. And he said, are you, one, are you that prophet that we're supposed to be looking for? And he said, no. And they said, who are you? He said, well, I'm the one. I'm the voice that is in the wilderness. I'm the one preparing the way of the Lord, making straight the way of the Lord. And so he was not only a servant of the Lord, but he found himself to be an ambassador of the Lord. And then he began to explain on who Jesus was. And we see that John also was a theologian. And I ask you, what about your testimony? Can you go back to a place in which you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are saved? I can take you back to the date when I gave my life to Christ, September 20th of 1998. I can take you back to the town. It was really at that time was what they called a village of South Lebanon, Ohio. I can take you back not to the same facility for it's been tore down, but I can take you to the parking lot and I can take you to the area. I can take you to the current facility where First Baptist Church South Lebanon is, but I can take you I can remember in my mind and show you almost if that facility was still there, I could take you back to about the same pew when, when the Holy Spirit of God began to bring great conviction in my heart and I prayed and received Christ that morning. Take you over to those pew and God called me into to the ministry just a few months after that, not even 19 years old yet. Got saved in September and called to preach in January. I can tell you and take you to those places where God was doing a work in my heart and my life. I'm not saying that by any means of boasting. I say that because I believe that when a person gets saved, they should know that they're saved. I don't think you can be saved and not know it, okay? I think that when you become born again, it is a life-changing experience in your life. You become a new creation. Old things pass away. Old all things become new. And all of a sudden, you and I are to become not only as saved people, the children of God, but become the servants of God. We're to be vocal witnesses for Christ. And we're to know about him in such a way in which we can teach the world about him. What is your testimony? Well, tonight I want to talk to you about when God called you. You know, what is your testimony? But in this specific situation here in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35, we're going to see an experience on when Jesus begins to call into himself that of the 12 disciples. But when did God call you? How did you respond to such calling? You know, are you obedient unto what God has called you to? Initially, he's going to call you to salvation, but after that, he's going to call you into service. And you got to ask, ask yourself and answer the question, am I obedient to what the Lord is calling me to do? So let me clarify something as well. I believe with all my heart that as somebody who comes to know Christ, not only has he given unto us, every one of us, at least one spiritual gift, he also has a specific place within the body of Christ in which we are to fit with the rest of the body of Christ to do the work of the ministry together under the head of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a special place. You have a special calling. You have a special plan that God has for you specifically in, in, in cooperation with the rest of the body of Christ to do the work of the ministry. And so if you claim the name of Christ, then you can know that he first called you to salvation. But as a saved person, you and I should try to determine the perfect will of God for our own personal lives. That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 12. As we present ourselves unto the Lord as a living sacrifice, we are to determine what is that perfect will of God for our lives. And so as you surrender yourself unto the Lord, you are to determine what plan and purpose. I remember when I first got saved, I told the Lord several times. I'd come to the altar pretty regular. And the preacher would preach, and I would come forward, and I would just talk to God, and I would say many times, Lord, 
I don't know exactly what you have planned for me. I was 18 years old. I just got out of high school. I was working some construction work. I was living out on my own, and this was a brand new journey all by myself. My family didn't understand it, and I had a few guys I worked with that did, but other than that, I was pretty much feeling like it was by myself other than the church that I started attending that summer at First Baptist. Wasn't raised in church, and so when I showed up there, I didn't know those people. I was just invited. But God used them as they embraced me, not only to lead me to Christ eventually, but God began to speak to my heart. And I remember telling him, Lord, I don't know what you want me to do, but if you will show me, I will do it. If you give me clarity, I will do it. And so throughout that time of me praying and seeking God, God put some people in my life to, to get me thinking about even the possibility of preaching his gospel. And come January 3rd of 1999, God gave me that calling. As plain as I can stand here and talk to you today, I know that God was speaking in my heart saying to me, preach my word. I didn't know hear much else that day during the preaching of the sermon, but I did hear, preach my word. From that point on, as I said yes to the Lord, made it known to the congregation and to my pastor, I began to try to follow the steps of the Lord in preparation for such a calling. Whether it was going to the, to the, to the mental home there um, in Goshen, Ohio, every other Thursday to preach to people. I mean, God, God put me in a place to preach. He, I told him I'd go anywhere and do whatever, and he said, okay. And so he began to let me preach there at that facility every other Thursday within the first year that I was beginning to preach. He went from that to, to leading me on to Bible college and moving me down to southeastern Kentucky, in which I've never returned back home. And, and I've still been in this place, to pastoring, to being in three different uh, countries outside the United States and several different states, preaching and pastoring three different churches. I say all that to say that God had a calling and has a calling on my life. God has a calling in your life. And God wants us to follow him. And so I ask you, when did God call you? What has God called you to? What gifts do you have? Are you using the abilities that God's given you to spread the gospel, to edify the body of Christ, to, to, to glorify the Lord, to win the lost, to make disciples? Are you being obedient to the voice of the Lord and his direction for your life? And the interesting thing about it is he understands how complicated life is. When God saved me and called me, I was a single individual. I was 18 years old. I was not married yet. And then eventually I got married in 2002. And then in 2006, the first child came into my life. And then in 2009, another one in 2012, I say the last one, uh, she's put a stop to it, she said, ain't no more. She's going to be the baby for now on. But, uh, but God knew, God knew in calling me how, how things would evolve, or I don't like the word, but to evolve in my life, how things would change, but he has direction and a purpose and an all-seeing, all-knowing God has a plan for every single one of us. And that starts with you as an individual that grows into your family, that moves on into the life of the church. Because folks, you can't separate your calling from the church because it is part of the church. God doesn't call us to be lone rangers. God doesn't call us to go out here and do our own thing. Even the apostle Paul on his missionary journey was sent out from Antioch of Syria. He did not get to just say, hey, I think I'm going to go do what I want. didn't work that way. Even as an apostle born out of due time, found himself in, in Antioch of Syria where God directed him and called him out to go on his missionary journey. And so when I think about those things, I think about how many folks, if we're not careful, will sit back and miss what God's trying to do in our lives, primarily because one reason they think, I ah, ain't called me to do nothing. Or maybe you think that I'm not somebody who God would call or God could use. I'm here to tell you, today to tell you that if he desires all people to be saved, so he's going to call you to that first and foremost. And after you become saved, you have a place in the body of Christ and you have a specific place in which God wants to use you. And so as we think about that tonight, I think about this passage of Scripture 
And I think about that John the Baptist, just the day before, was there preaching when he was confronted by the religious leaders of Jerusalem. And as he was confronted, and they asked him who he was, and he told them what role that he had, he then sees Jesus after he told them, there's going to be somebody who's going to come after me, who is preferred before me, who I'm not worthy to even unloose the, the latchet on his sandals. And he says that this person is, perceived, is, is preferred before me because he was before me. And it was Jesus coming, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And so as he makes such a proclamation, he points people to Jesus of Nazareth, claiming to be that he is the Christ. So the next day, John the Baptist, you remember, he was getting a following himself. He was out there, this kind of a wild-looking man, really. I mean, he took the Nazarite vow. He's not cutting his hair. I mean, you know, people today talk about facial hair with men. I'm thinking, you, you must not read the Bible. But, uh, but here, here is an individual that didn't cut his hair at all. You know, and he took the Nazarite vow, and there he's out there in the wilderness looking like, no doubt, a unique individual with his dress, his apparel, and he's out there preaching repentance and telling people not only to turn from their sin, but to show that their repentance is sincere by following through in baptism, making that public and preparing the way of the coming Messiah. That's what John the Baptist was doing. He was telling people to get ready and get right because God is on his way. The Messiah is on his way. The promised seed of Genesis 3.15 is on his way. Get ready. And so it says the next day as John's, you know, got him a little following, John said, it says there that John was standing there the next day with two of his disciples. And it says, looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. I don't know, um, you know, I've been preaching a long time and reading the Bible a long time, and I don't know how I didn't even, you know, I don't know how I didn't put it together. And as, as then I was just studying this passage of Scripture, and it got to thinking, there is Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, who is following after John first. First. You know, when, it, when we think about this passage of Scripture here, here, here it is. He's following after John the Baptist. When I think about our own personal calling, you know what I think? I think there's steps in our walk, and there's different times in which God takes us to the next place in our own spiritual walk. He first goes and he's following after John the Baptist, who is preparing the way of Messiah, who's pointing people towards the direction of Messiah, but they didn't know who he was. But when the Messiah shows up and John the Baptist says, there he is. He told them the day before, there's Jesus of Nazareth, behold the Lamb of God. When I think about the next day, he's hanging out with two of these people again, one of them there being Andrew, and he says, look at him walking. See that guy right there? That's him, that's the Lamb of God. That's the one who came to fulfill the sacrificial system. You know all those sacrifices they did? You know during Passover, you know all those things that happened? Guess what? That man right there, has come to fulfill the law. He didn't come to do away with the law, but he come to fulfill the law. He's going to fulfill every sacrifice. He's going to fulfill every feast day. He's going to fulfill every prophecy. That man right there was the promised seed of Genesis 3.15 after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and death and sin passed upon all of humanity, and we've been a wreck ever since. There's the guy right there. That's him, the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. I seen the Spirit of God descend upon him yesterday, and the Lord who called me to, to prepare the way in the wilderness said, when you see the Spirit descend upon that individual, you'll know that he is the Lamb of God. He is the Messiah. And John the Baptist said, there he is. When I think about our callings, I think our callings I have steps of growth in them. I, I first got saved. I was following after the direction of the Word of God, of course, being spoken through by my pastor. I mean, when I got saved, I, I trusted the Lord as my Savior. I believed ultimately that the Bible was the Word of God. And, and again, I had no reason, no theological background, nothing that was telling me that other than the fact that it was the Word of God that was preached during that summertime 
that conviction was brought in my heart. And it was showing me my lostness and exposing the hidden things of my heart and making them open. I, it, it would appear that in my heart, in my mind anyway, that everybody knew what was going on in my life. But it really wasn't the case. What was the case is that everything inside my life is open and naked before God and whom I have to deal with. And the Word of God was exposing that. And throughout that time of conviction in my heart and then eventually me surrendering to the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, I began to listen to the sermons. I began to show up to Sunday school and listen to my Sunday school teacher. And I began to be taught by them and following after the Lord through their instruction and their guidance and their direction. I followed in believer's baptism. I began to give my tithes and my offerings. My pastor marked my Bible and said, this is how you tell someone how to be saved and you need to go tell them what Jesus did in your life. And so that's what I began to do. When, when Miss Rose McNutt needed somebody to set tables up, which we're going to need some help after church. There's a little plug for that. Um, so when she said, hey, meet us down there at the fellowship hall to put up some tables and some chairs, guess what? 18 years old, driving about 40 minutes to go home all by myself, I went down there to help Miss Rose McNutt. When she said, Anthony, get on that chair and get up there and do this and go do that and go do this and go do that, I said, okay, and I went over there and did this and I went over there and done that. I was following the Lord when my pastor come and told me about some things in my life that I needed to change. I didn't get huff up mad and go find another church to go to. He showed me in the scripture with those other two guys that shared the gospel with me, and guess what I did? I started changing those things in my life because I didn't know that they were wrong, but they began to show me from the scripture. Then when God called me to preach and when God led me away from First Baptist Church South Lebanon down to Bible College in Bell County, guess what? I went from just listening to what? As God put some men in my life, and they were there for a purpose, I went from that to having to hear on my own to take the step to go and grow. And eventually, you go to a spot where you're helping someone else hear from God, showing someone else how they're to follow. I think that there should be some growth in our life. And I think that in this passage of Scripture, it shows that. It shows first and foremost that there were some folks that were listening to the Word of God that they were being prepared by the Lord through their messenger there, but eventually these people had to go and follow after Jesus. You know, at the end of the day, isn't that the goal? Is to know for sure that we're following after the Lord Jesus. And the neat thing about it is today, folks, is that you and I who are saved, the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, comes inside of our heart and our lives. Every single person. Nobody's excluded from that. When you get saved, you're baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. He takes up a permanent residence inside your life for you are the temple of a living God and He begins to work on you. He begins to shape you and mold you. He begins to teach you and guide you and direct you and empower you to be what you are to be in the Lord. But you are to follow after Him. You have direct access to God as a saved person. You can talk to him. You can hear from him. He's given us his revelation from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 so we can hear and we can know and we can understand what God thinks about things in this world. We're to follow after him. We have such a great opportunity to not only have our sins forgiven, but to follow the path that God has for our lives. And so he says again, in that next day, John stood there with his two disciples looking upon Jesus as he walked and said, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Do you know that in your calling that you need to be able to progress from just doing, and listen to me, God puts people on our path, whether it's pastors, whether it's close friends, deacons, Sunday school teachers, whoever it may be, that God has put in your path to mentor you or to help direct you and guide you. Those folks are there by the Lord, but you need to become, there needs to come a time in your life where you go from having to hold their hand, so to speak, to be able to hear from the Lord directly. And you say, what do you mean directly? That's what I mean. I'm not necessarily saying that you're going to hear an audible voice. I haven't yet to hear an audible voice. But the Spirit of God who's inside of you will speak to you through the Word of God. And so as you and I are in the Word of God, as you and I are around the people of God, as you and I are around the proclaimed Word of God, guess what? You're going to learn how to hear from Him. 
you're going to be able to learn how to follow after him. You're going to be able to make those steps. And, and you're not going to have to worry about somebody all the time holding your hand. You're going, to have, you're going to be able to determine what is God's will for your life. Now, there's always going to be people in your life. I'm not saying that. We're part of the body of Christ. But what I am saying is this. Those people that are around your life, they should be there to confirm what's going on in your life from, from, from a preaching standpoint. For instance, I'll give you an example. And I've shared this before, but before God called me to preach, God used a man by the name of Larry Brandenburg to talk about the calling of preaching to me. Now, Larry just said it kind of nonchalant in a way. I mean, he was being serious, but he just said, hey, when are you going to announce your call to preach? I hadn't been saved very long, and I didn't know what he's talking about. I didn't even know there was a specific calling to preach. I mean, I knew that there was the pastor up there, and he was preaching, but I didn't have any background in that. I didn't have, understand all of that. But he said to me one day, when are you going to announce your call to preach? And my response to Larry was, well, if God ever calls me to preach, I will. But he ain't ever called me to preach. That's what I told him. Well, God used him to get my ears in tune. And so in January of 99, when he called me to preach, guess what? I did what I told Larry I would do. I would follow after him. God used Larry to help me learn how to listen. To God. It kind of reminds me when, whenever Eli was talking to Samuel. And, and whenever Samuel was up there, sitting there in the temple, being a servant there of Eli because his mama Hannah had, had dedicated him to the Lord. And in the middle of the night, there's God calling Samuel. And Samuel gets up and he goes to Eli and he said, well, What can I do? And he said, I didn't call for you. Go on back to bed. He said, Okay. And then he got back, heard again, heard his name again. And he gets up and he goes, to Eli, what do you want? I didn't call you. Go on back to bed. And then, then it dawns on Eli. God's calling Samuel. So the next time it happens, he says to Samuel, hey, next time you hear that, you just tell God what you want. I'm right here. What do you want? And he learned how to listen. Samuel eventually would go on and be a prophet himself go about being a judge himself for the nation of Israel. Anthony began to learn how to hear not just uh, the initial calling of salvation, but then the call to ministry. But then as I grew in my walk, then I was beginning to learn how to determine what God's will and plan was for my life as that would unfold. He didn't tell me everything in advance. He still doesn't tell me everything in advance. But as those steps go, I learn how to take the next step. You know, whether it is moving and, and packing my bags as a 19-year-old boy leaving my home and everybody I knew to go down to southeastern Kentucky to go into Bible college not knowing how in the world I was going to pay the bills. You know, I didn't know none of that. God took care of all that. I mean, when I think about that, God just took care of every single thing. Tell me this neat thing real quick and we'll move on in the scripture. My stepdad's last name was Beck. His name was John Beck and he passed away, and he's 54 years old. He's alcoholic and drug addict, so he was hard on himself, and he eventually passed away at 54 years old. But my stepdad wreaked havoc in my life for quite a while. Um, he he was, came into my life when I was about three. He went to prison when I was about five. He got out of prison when I was 10, and from the time I was about 10 until, you know, I finally moved away on my own, you know, he pretty much wreaked havoc in my life, whether it was through all kinds of foolishness as the drugs and alcohol, you know, just wrecked his life and he couldn't do it by himself. He had to, to cause trouble with everybody else at the, at the house. His name was John Beck. When I was down there in Bible college, um, I got some money, some Pell Grant money because we were poor when I was growing up. And I was one of the first kids going to college for my family, so I, I qualify for some things. I got some other little scholarships here and there, and then somebody whose name was Mr. Beck, who lived in Florida, had a lot of money. And you know what Mr. Beck decided to do? Pay my, whatever I didn't, whatever money I owed on my schooling, every semester, he foot the bill. Now you tell me that ain't crazy. And you tell me that ain't God. You know, there's plenty of Bible colleges or, or at least schools that I could have went to. Some would have been closer home. Some would have been further away, but God directed my path 
down to Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. In January of 2000, I moved down there, and God took care of my every single need. You know, when I moved on down to Bible College, First Baptist Church sent me on down there. I didn't have a dress clothes one going, but they put me in a suit and a tie. They put, sent me in with a computer. They sent me with some cash. They sent me with toilet paper, toothbrush, deodorant. I mean, they packed me. I said, man, these people either love me real good or want to get rid of me one. But they sent me on out of there, folks. And then to make sure I stayed away, they sent me some money every month. I mean, think about that. I had no idea how these things were going to happen. But I knew this. I knew that God was taking care of me. And I learned how to take the necessary steps and to grow. You know, th these folks were walking with John the Baptist. Was there a thing wrong with walking with John the Baptist? Not at all. But John the Baptist said, the fellow coming after me is preferred before me because he was before me. In fact, I'm not worthy to even unloose the, the latchet on his shoes. And so guess what? If you're going to take the next step, guess what you have to tell John the Baptist? I appreciate my time with you, brother, but I'm going on with him. Amen? I mean, I appreciate everything you've done for me, but you said it. You've got to decrease and he can increase. I'm going to go ahead and follow him. And guess what? John the Baptist wasn't upset with that. John the Baptist would be proud of that. John the Baptist came to prepare the way and be the voice in the wilderness, and he fulfilled his calling, and people started following after Jesus of Nazareth because John said, that's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We've got to learn to grow. You know, as you think about your own personal life, you've got to grow. One of the neat things about being a pastor is you get to experience that. You get to see people who grow in the Lord. You know, you get to see people come to know Christ, and that's an awesome experience. But it's also just, to me, almost as equally as it awesome to see folks take the next steps in the faith. Whether, whether they step up in various roles in the church, whether they surrender to maybe even vocational ministry, some people say yes to the calling to preach or to go on mission, be a missionary, whatever it may be, but to see people take those steps to go on and, and to be what God calls them to be. And so these, when they sitting there, they heard Jesus, they heard him speak, and then they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said, What seek you? And they said unto him, Rabbi, or which is being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? Where do you abide? And he said unto them, You come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him. That day, for it was about the tenth hour, and one of whom, one of the two that heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. I don't know what the other guy decided to do. I don't know who it was. But one of the two said, you know what? I'm going to keep hanging out with this guy. I'm going to keep following after him. Do you know what I think is, is interesting in this passage of Scripture? Not only should we be willing to take the steps that we need to, to take the next steps, but listen, I think it also, we ought to make the decision that we're not going to be the one that didn't follow. Everybody has to make that decision. You know that? I mean, everybody has excuses on why they can't be as committed to Jesus as they should be. Everybody has excuses, you know? But Jesus would later on tell some folks, he would say things like this, Hey, go, go preach the gospel. And when they said, hey, I got to go bury my father for it first, he said, listen, you let the dead bury the dead. You go preach the gospel. Well, well let me go ahead and I'll follow after you. You know, what do you want me to do? You know, well, go, go preach. Well, I will, but let me go tell everybody goodbye. He said, man puts his hand to the plow and looks back. It's not fit for the kingdom of God. The one person that showed up on his own and said, hey, I'll follow after you. Jesus knew his heart and said, hey, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. You know, some people think following after Jesus is going to be all, all, all the time. It's a great situation. Well, living for Jesus, you don't get no better. But that don't mean that the world's going to like you. That don't mean that you're going to have everything easy going on in your life. You can know Jesus never going to leave you, nor forsake you. You can know when you leave this world, you're going to enter into the presence of God. You can know all the things that God's going to do in your life is going to be good. But listen, Paul found himself beaten. Paul found himself in prison. Paul found himself shipwrecked. Paul eventually found himself laying down his life for the gospel's sake. 
Jesus come to do the will of the Father. The will of the Father led him to the cross of Calvary. And he took on the sin of the world, folks. That ain't the best plan, so to speak, from a, from a human standpoint, right? But it was perfect. Jesus said it like this in the garden. He said, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. Let it pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So nothing about this passage of Scripture, I see an individual that's willing to take the next step. He, he goes from following John the Baptist to following the one whom John the Baptist was pointing people to. He's willing to take that next step. He also was, a, was seeing that he was willing to make a, a long-term commitment. They went over there one day, it says. He went with them that one day. Where, where are you hanging out at? Where are you, where are you abiding at? Well, you come and see. And when they get there at the 10th hour of the day, those two hang out with them for that day, and, and it seems to be that they one decided, I'm going to go about my business. It was nice meeting you, Jesus. Andrew said, I'm going to stay right here. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, you know, I think I'm going to just stay right here. It says there that he first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, Thou shalt be called Cephas, which by interpretation is a stone. And when we think about it, he's talking about, you know, here's a stone, or we call him Peter, and really it's a small stone. When I think about saying yes to the calling of the Lord, I think about taking the next step. I think about the long-term commitment that goes along with that. Listen, folks, Jesus has called us to commit our life to him. That's why some folks don't want to say yes to the calling because they just ain't really sure about the lifelong commitment. That's what the problem is today. I mean, think about, think about our world. Think about our culture. Think about people in general. Where's the commitments at? People are committed when, when they feel like the benefit is, is worth it. People are committed when it's easy. People are committed when it's popular, you know. But what about when it's hard? What about when people... Decide to flee Jesus. You know, that happens, doesn't it? I mean, even when Jesus is going to the cross, only one of the disciples hung out all the way to the cross, and that was John. We know where the other, we know where one went. One sold him for 30 pieces of silver. So there's, there's John who went all the way to the cross. There's one of them that decided he'd prosper by giving up Jesus in the garden for 30 pieces of silver to later on try to give it back because he knew his regret, but he didn't really repent in his heart. As the Bible says, godly sorrow brings about repentance, but worldly sorrow brings about death. And, and here's Judas, and what does he do? He decides to go up, and he kills himself. But then you got ten others, and where'd they run off to? Peter denied him. The other ones ran off to, you know. They all find when it was hard, when people, when it got dangerous, people started scattering. You know what I learned over the last couple years? People worry about a little bit of danger, they scatter quick. Hello? Huh? Well, Brother Anthony, we don't know about this sickness. Brother Anthony, didn't you hear what the governor said? Well, what happens if the police come? What happens if they show up? What are we supposed to do? Well, tell them to pull up a chair, get in a pew. <laughs> they can worship too, amen, hello? That's even a rhyme right there. Get in the pew and they can worship too. You know, um, we'll back to blue. Hello, I'll go on from now. But, you know, the, the thing is, folks, we are supposed to be committed to the long-term commitment, no matter what the outcome is. You know, I've been living for Christ now for 20 years or longer. 22 or something like that, if I've been saved. 20 years I've been pastoring. Uh, almost 20 years, I, 22 years I've been preaching. And you know what? It's been difficult from time to time. But I can say with all honesty, there's not been a time in my life, there might have been a time in my life where I say, God, if you're done with me doing this or that, that's fine. But there's never been a time in my life where I said, I'm done serving you. I'll do whatever you want me to do. 
It doesn't matter how hard it is. It doesn't matter if it goes along with the plan I thought. It doesn't, none of that matters to me, Lord. I'll do what you want me to do, and no matter how hard it's been sometimes, and no matter how difficult or how people have treated over the years, I know this, Lord. You saved me 22 years ago. You've been nothing but good to me all this time. You're a good God. You're a gracious God. You're a merciful God. You're way better than me than I ever deserve. And you purchased me. And by that simple fact of you purchasing me alone, I'm going to live for you. Whatever capacity you want that to be, that's fine with me. But I'm going to live for you because you're in it for the long haul of my life. You come to give me eternal life. And so I'm going to be committed to you. And so out of these two here, Andrew says, I'm going to hang out with him. But not only does he say I'm going to stay with him, guess what else we're supposed to be doing? Get some others to come. If you believe that Jesus is the Lamb of God, the Christ, the Messiah, if you believe he is the one true and living God, the only Savior of the world, doesn't it just make sense that you're going to go get your loved ones to go to? I mean, if you understand that we're sinners, listen, Andrew had to understand that. I mean, John the Baptist had been preaching repentance. He'd been preaching repentance. What's he preaching repentance for? Because he was amongst a wicked and perverse generation. Because we, in, we are inherent sinners. And we, we go about living a sinful life. We need the grace of God. We need the Messiah to forgive us and to save us. And so he's preaching that. So this isn't new to Andrew. And so if he knows... That, that people, he himself needs forgiveness, they need the Christ, they need the Messiah, guess what? You care anything about your loved ones, what are you going to do? You're going to go tell them too, right? Isn't that what he did? Andrew had been hanging out with John the Baptist. I don't know if Simon Peter had, but Andrew had been. He'd heard this old man out there in the wilderness calling people to repentance, baptizing folks in the Jordan River. Andrew heard the word, and Andrew started following him. And when Messiah shows up and, and John the Baptist says, that's the Lamb of God, Andrew says, I appreciate everything. I'm going to go follow him. And then when he comes to a complete understanding that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ they've been looking for, he goes to Simon and he says, hey, you got to come with me. You've got to come see this fellow. We found the one we've been looking for. He's here. He's here. He says, he first findeth his own brother. Hey, let me tell you something, folks. And so what our calling is, is to win our family to Jesus. That's everybody. Win our family to Jesus. Now, is everybody going to come when you tell them to come? No, but they sure ain't going to come if you don't tell them to come. Huh? I don't know why we think that people are going to show up to church, people are going to come and trust in Jesus when we don't say much about it. Hello? Huh? I, I, where's our family at? Where, where's our, where's our uh, you know, some of us got children don't come to church, some of us got grandchildren don't come to church, some of us got brothers and sisters don't come to church, some of us got... Parents that don't come to church. Some of them have got aunts and uncles that don't go to church and, and, and don't know Christ, you know? I mean, if we know him, if we've come to him, we know he is the, the, the Lamb of God that took away our sin. We know he's come to take away the sin of the world. We know that hell's real. We know that folks who die without him go to hell. That's what the Bible teaches. Then sure enough, we ought to be motivated to tell them, you need to come to Jesus. Not everybody's going to want to hear that. I remember when I first got saved, I went and started telling people, hey, I got saved. Jesus in my life. Nobody in my family understood that. I say nobody. I had an aunt one that understands that she ain't living for the Lord now, but she understood it. My dad, who, who just recently passed away, he went to church a little bit when I was growing up, and uh, I remember that time in his life. I went to church maybe one time with him, twice maybe at the most growing up. But then he... He, you know, he divorced that, the, my stepmom that he was with at that time, and he never went back to church, my knowledge. When I got saved, he didn't come see me get baptized when I invited him. When I first preached my first sermon, he didn't come, didn't want to have nothing to do with it. I talked to him a few times here and there about Christ and so on and so forth. But he understood anyway, a little bit. 
And most, folk, most folks did not understand. And, and, you know, it was, it became apparent that they were uncomfortable when I said, hey, you need to come to Jesus. You know, I remember my brother right below me, well, he started to avoid me every time I showed up. I mean, he'd be gone. My mom one day said, hey, T, they called me T, T, uh, you need to quit preaching on Christopher all the time you come around. I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, I mean, you, you got, he, he don't even want to be around when you show up. I said, that ain't got nothing to do with me. That's called conviction. That's called God's dealing with his heart. He thinks he can run away from me. That's fine, but he can't run away from God. You may not have a clue what's going on, Mom, but I know exactly what's happening in his life. He's uncomfortable because he's been confronted and been convicted, and he don't know what to do with it. You know? Oh, I had other cousins. They same way still, some of them. You know? But what are we supposed to be doing? Going to these folks. You know how you feel these pews? Hmm? You got to tell people about Jesus. You know how you do work in the life of your family? Listen, this world's a mess, people. I mean, we've got the craziest stuff going on in this world right now. And I, I, I just never thought in a million years I'd be in a place that I am looking at all this stuff that's going on in this world. I just never thought. I, ne I never thought I'd imagine, you know, these things coming and that's going on. It just blows my mind. But with all that said, the reality is, God knew exactly what's going to play out. And the same message is applicable today as it was when he showed up almost 2,000 years ago and what he said to Adam and Eve and Satan in the form of a serpent in the garden at the beginning. And guess what it is? You got to be covered by the blood. You got to come to Christ. You know, that first sacrifice that God made to cover Adam and Eve, taking that innocent animal, shedding his blood, taking his life, taking his skin and covering them up was a picture of the lamb to come. And Jesus fulfilled that, folks. All those things in between, Jesus fulfilled that. And he fulfilled that. And today we have to take that same message to a lost and dying world. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. These folks have got all this stuff that's going on in their hearts and their minds, and they don't know. They don't know the left hand from the right hand. They don't know if they're boys or girls. They don't know what's right and wrong. They don't know. Uh, you know they're dependent upon substances to, to either give them peace or to distract their minds or their current situations. All these things that are going out on in this world. And let me tell you something. What we got to be telling them. Hey, you know what? Jesus is the Savior of your soul. He's wanting to take, give you peace in your heart, to give you clarity in your mind. Man, there's a lot of stuff going on, and guess who the answer is to that? Jesus. We ought to be telling folks, this is what we have here with, Simon, with, with Andrew going to Simon Peter, his own brother first. And he said, we have found the Messiah, which is interpreted the Christ, and we brought him to Jesus. Jesus says, hey, hey, Simon, the son of Jonas. Isn't that awesome how Jesus is? I've been on different missionary trips. I went to Honduras the first time, and I went to uh, Malawi, Africa the second time. I went to Haiti the third time. And you know what was so unique, or not unique, what was interesting that was similar in each one of those situations is that when I showed up there, I met people I didn't. But when I began to share the gospel, guess what? Jesus is already doing the work. Just pretty amazing how that works. But Jesus was already doing the work. When you start talking to someone about Jesus, introducing them to Jesus, guess what? All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit of God, the Word of God begins to do in the life of that person. Like, that, like it happened to me. Hey, Anthony, that's lived over there in Fairfield, Ohio, 29 View Drive. Uh, how you doing? What you been up to? You know, it was like, hold on a second. How do they know this about me? You think that is interesting or what? What Jesus said to Simon Peter, hey, Simon, you're going to change your name to Peter. You think he knew about Peter? Absolutely knew about Peter. He knew about Peter. He knew Peter was going to deny him. He also knew Peter would get out of the boat too, didn't he? Nobody else wanted to get out of the boat. Peter said, I'll get out. He also knew Peter would speak up there in the Mount of Transfiguration. Hey, what do you all want me to do? You want me to build a temple on you, Lord, and Moses and Elijah? 
and we'll just stay here forever. Jesus looks over at him and says, hey, slow down for a minute, you know? He also knew that John would beat him in a foot race to get to the, to the empty tomb. But Simon Peter would say, get out of the way. You may have beat me here, but I'm going to go in first. And he went in. He also was a man who was willing to preach Pentecost. He also was willing to confront the same people who scared him to death when he denied and Caiaphas and Annas and the rest of the priests and so on and so forth. He was willing to say, you know what? I may have denied him three times before, but not today. You know, the same Peter uh, was end up being crucified, but he wouldn't be willing to be crucified like the same manner of Jesus because he said he wasn't worthy of such. You know, God knew. So we need to go out here and tell our friends, our families. If we're called and we are to the ministry and we are, then we need to start where we need to, and that's at home. That's where we need to start, you know? And then it needs to spread. It says there in verse 43, then following, the day following, Jesus would go forth in the Galilee and find Philip and say unto him, follow me. And Philip was of Bethsaida in the city of Andrew and Peter. Here's Philip. They come, they was in the same town of Andrew and Peter, and Philip finds Nathaniel. He goes to his friend, his family member. We have found him whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. You know what I think is important about our calling? We got to be willing to take the next step. Not only do we take the next step, but we need to be in it for the long term. We need to tell our family, but guess what? We got to make sure that the word of God is what's directing our path. Following after Christ isn't about a feeling. So many times people gauge their spirituality off of their feeling. Let me tell you something. Some days I can feel on top of the mountain. Other days you feel like you're in the valley. Some days you feel like what you ask of God is getting given to you right then. Other days you wonder, does he hear anything you got to say? There's sometimes you're reading the Bible, it feels like it just jumps off the pages and your understanding is never before. And there's other times you think, man, I don't know a thing I'm reading. There's times where you feel like when somebody's going to hear you when you talk and you share the gospel. Other times you think nobody wants to listen to me. There's times when I've preached, I feel like, man, that's a pretty good sermon. Most of the time I say, dude, you can't preach a lick. And it's like, well, that's all right, because God's the one that's going to have to use this base thing of the world. That's what he said he wants to use. He's sure enough done a good job finding this guy. He is nothing and, and nobody. So that's what he said he wants to use. You have to learn, but there's times where you feel like you're close and other times you feel like you're not, you know? But that's not what we base our calling off of. It's not what we base our walk with Jesus off of. What, what did Philip say? Philip said, Nathaniel, we have found him whom Moses and the law and the prophets did right. You know what I think? I think Philip had an understanding of the Old Testament Scripture. And I think that when Andrew and Peter and Jesus were there and they called Philip out, guess what Philip did? In his mind and his heart, this is the Christ. And guess what he started doing? Started sizing Jesus up for a minute. The Bible says to prove all things. Try the spirits. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. I think he's looking at him like, who's your mama? Mary. Hold on a second. Is she that one that was conceived? When she says she's a virgin, that's exactly who she is. Isaiah said that, didn't he? Well, hold on a second. You say you're from Nazareth, but where was you born at? Oh, I was born in Bethlehem. Hmm, didn't Micah say that? Uh, you ever been to Egypt, Jesus? I don't really remember the journey as I was a little baby, but Herod decided he wanted to kill everybody. I'm like two years old and under. And my stepdad, Joseph, he told my mama, we probably need to go down to Egypt. And so he took me down to Egypt until it was safe to come home. And we come home, we went to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Hmm. Interesting. You know what Philip started putting the dots together? And he said, 
This is the guy that Moses in the law was talking about. This is the guy that the prophets wrote about. Huh, I better go tell Nathaniel to come on. And he went and he got Nathaniel. I, 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 I like Nathaniel because Nathaniel's a skeptic, and that's okay. I think you ought to be a little skeptical. I think that every one of us ought to have a little spiritual skepticism about us because what's going on in the world today is a mess. I'm telling you, the modern church movement is a joke, just to be honest with you. I mean, when I sit there and listen to these folks that say that God's called them to preach and the pastor, and I listen to what they've got to say, and it has no content in the Word of God whatsoever, it's all based on the show that they're able to put through and, and, and appeal to the emotions of individuals with no real uh, objective truth. I'm telling you, we're in a mess. We are. The church is in a mess. So you can be a little skeptical. I, I expect every one of y'all to be the same way when I'm up here preaching. Have the book out. Follow along with the scripture. Try and test what's being said. If it lines up with the book, though, you need to go all in. Hello? And so when he gets there, Nathaniel says, ah. he said, listen, this is Jesus of Nazareth, Nathaniel, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel says, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? You know, nobody said that exactly to me, but they do say this. Anything good come out of Ohio? That's what they say, and I come down here. And they come out of Ohio, I say, listen, God sent me as a missionary to y'all. Hello. Huh? Don't think it too high of yourself as y'all. And then you should because this Buckeye came down here amongst the briars to win y'all to Jesus. Hello? Huh? I mean, I was willing to take on y'all's accent and everything. Hello? I become all things for all men, even if it's a hillbilly. Hello? And anything good come out of Nazareth? Oh, yes, the very best. The very best. In fact, the only good. Hello? The only good thing. And so when Nathaniel shows up, I like Jesus. Jesus beats him to the bunch. Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile or deceit. He knew who Peter was, didn't he? He knew who Nathaniel was, too. And Nathaniel said, where do you know me from? And Jesus says, before Philip called thee, thou was under the fig tree, and I saw thee. Well, you know what Nathaniel knew? There wasn't nobody around then. And Nathaniel answered and said, Rabbi, Master, it's amazing how God can change our tunes when we let him. He went from what good thing come out of Nazareth to a master. Master, you know what? You are the son of God, the king of Israel. Man, that's, some, that's a big title, isn't it? You are God in the flesh. You are God the son. You are the rightful king of the Jews. Jesus said, because I saw you under the fig tree, you believe this? Son, you're going to get to see a whole lot more than this. In fact, you're going to get to see heaven open up. The angels of God are going to ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. You're going to get a witness a whole lot more than me just simply telling you I saw you under the fig tree before Philip came to you. Folks, what we have here is that in our calling, just like Nathaniel, he took the step of faith. What about you tonight? What about your calling? You know? What about your calling? You say, I, I don't know. Well, I just told you that you have one. And that's the truth. And so you got to do some, some searching. You know? What's God called me to do? What's God gifted me? You know? Some of you need to take the next step. Some of y'all been content in the first step or second step or third step, wherever you're at, and you're calling, and you're content right there. You know? Larry Brandenburg who told me about, you know, about the calling to ministry and asked me when I was going to 
uh, announced my call to preach. He knew all about the calling. Larry's dead now. He went to go be with the Lord. But Larry was called into the ministry. He was a deacon at First Baptist Church, South Lebanon. But before he was a deacon, God called him to preach. And from his own testimony, you know, he thought that God was going to direct him into full-time evangelism. You know, God didn't have that plan for him. God tried to lead him into the pastorate. And Larry bucked up on that. I didn't understand it then. I understand it now. But he bucked up on that. And Larry settled for something else. Now, deacon is an important spot in the role in the church. I'm not downplaying that. But that ain't what God was calling him initially to do. You know? Larry was one of the better Sunday school teachers I'd ever been around. He's a very good Sunday school teacher. He had an adult Sunday school class, and that's where I went. You know, most of the people in that class were 20 years older than me. I sat right there, and every Sunday that year that I was at First Baptist before I moved, and that's where I went to Sunday school class. He was very good. He, he was knowledgeable of the Scripture. He taught very good, and, but, but he, he wasn't doing everything he was supposed to do. He didn't take that step. He stayed settled where he was at. Another fellow named Larry, I don't know what's up with the Larrys, but his son was one that shared the gospel with me first. But he was called into the ministry for whatever reason, didn't surrender. I'm going to tell you what he did. He suffered physically up until he went to go be with the Lord. You know, I know people that just settle. Some people, maybe they don't have that same type of, you know, suffering that, Larry Kane Sr. did, or, or, or maybe it was maybe something as, you know, as, as open what, as Larry Brandenburg said, but there's a lot of people, I think, in the church that are not growing in their faith because they're not willing to take the next step in their calling. They still want to hang out with John the Baptist when you're supposed to be hanging out with the one he's pointing you to. You won't take that next step. Some ain't willing for the commitment, you know. Some want to just come and go. You know, man, if I get committed to teach a Sunday school class, that means that I got to be here every Sunday. Hello? Uh, you probably should be here anyway. Right? I mean, that's not too difficult. You know? Well, man, if, if, if God's setting me apart for this office or that office in the church, I mean, that's, that's some real commitment. I know some folks who, who, who churches thought that they would be a, a, a good candidate to be a deacon, and when they started asking them questions about, you know, do you believe this? Or, or you, I know one folk that said, you know what, I'm not going to be a deacon because I'm not going to commit to tithing. You know? Hmm. It's interesting. You know? There's a lot of things out there. You know, that people aren't completely committed because they want to come and go. You know? What about you? What about you and your calling? Some don't want to be that committed because they're afraid to confront and talk to their family. Some ain't willing to just follow the book. Some people want to just have, you know, very little accountability. So they say, I don't know, I'm not really going to follow them that close. Hmm? What about you? What about you tonight and your calling? Ask Brother Dwayne and Miss Lula as they come to lead us in a time of invitation. This altar is open, folks. What about your calling? Now listen. I told you what I did. I think that's the simplest way. People say, how do you know? Start asking God. That's how you know. How do kids learn? They'll bug you to death with questions, won't they? They ask you some of the questions. You think, where did that even come from? You know? I'll get called sometime as pastor. They'll say, hey, little so-and-so asked me a question. I told him, you need to talk to the preacher about that one. You know, they ask a question. You know what I tell them? Oh, you better talk to Jesus about that one. I don't know. You know? But... That's what we need to do. Get out of our seats. Get out of our comfort zone. Quit hiding behind whatever we're hiding behind and do business with God. Start talking to him. And no matter how old you are or young you are, if you know Christ, you've got a purpose and a plan and a calling in your life. It's time for you and I to figure it out and go forward in our walk with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you tonight as you move during this invitation. Lord, as you spoke to our hearts, Maybe you've called someone to salvation. 
You know, in the midst of us talking about a calling, we know that the first calling of everything is to come to you. If there's someone here that does not know you as your own personal Lord and Savior, I pray that tonight they will come to you. They'll step out of their, their seat and they'll walk the aisle. They'll be willing to confess their sin to you, repent of their sin, and ask you to come to their life as they make a commitment to you. I pray they will come. Lord, for us who are already saved, I pray that you'd help us to, to, to work as you work in our hearts to be able to speak to you and communicate with you and ask you for direction and guidance, I pray that we would come. We wouldn't just stay back there comfortable in our seats. We'd get out and do business with you and be serious as you direct our paths. And we just ask you to move here. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen.